Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51% a show about women reshaping our world. Coming up, we take a look at a baby boom of a different kind in India, that being surrogate mothers. Also, I meet noted Egyptian-American feminist Mona El-Tahawi, who's calling for a sexual revolution in the Middle East. And the Egyptian women who are taking a stand against sexual harassment by forming their very own taxi company. But we begin in India, where surrogacy has become a multi-million euro business. It's been made all the more lucrative by the high number of desperate foreigners seeking out surrogate mothers. On average, Indian women can rent out their wombs for some 7,000 euros, worth about 20 years of a local salary. But they're not the only ones that stand to financially benefit, as this report shows. It's a small town far from India's bustling major cities. But it's here that Dr. Patel has set up shop. She's spent the past decade bringing some 840 babies into the world using surrogate mothers. She takes us for a tour of the huge building site that will soon be her new clinic. Here is the pharmacy. Here there will be all the consulting rooms. Here all the diagnostic areas, yoga room, acupuncture room. Here, fertility problems will be treated, and in the basement, lodgings for over a hundred surrogate mothers. Upstairs, a hotel will accommodate future parents that want to be close by to their surrogate. This clinic will in fact be Dr. Patel's second. Her first opened its doors 10 years ago. In the waiting room are Asian and Western couples seeking babies, and the pregnant women carrying them. Today, the doctor's seeing Erica, an American who lives in Italy. In total, Erica has paid 25,000 euros, an all-in-one price that covers everything, including the delivery of her baby. In Italy, it's illegal, so we can't, we can't do it in Italy. It's not an option. Um, and in the United States, it's very, very expensive, and the rights are with the surrogate and not with the parents, with the uh, biological parents. Um, so we feel that we have a better uh, more rights here. The surrogate mothers live in these two small houses outside of town. Dr. Patel takes us to visit the 40 women living inside one of them. All are pregnant. Each woman receives just over 7,000 euros for carrying the child. Here, it's a sum equal to about 20 years' salary. For Shilpa, a widow, it was an essential means to feed her two daughters and put a roof over their heads. I'm happy because I'm going to make a couple happy, but I'm also a bit sad. The baby spent nine months inside me. It's quite heartbreaking to be separated, but just a bit. Under constant surveillance, the women aren't allowed to leave this house during their pregnancy. Family visits are once a week. Yotsana can't be there for her daughter's birthday but she sees it as a necessary sacrifice. I have no money, but I have children. They have money, but no children. That's all. That's life. Clinics like Dr. Patel's have multiplied in India in recent years. There are now an estimated 3,000. When the Arab uprising began, there was much hope that women's rights would stand to benefit. But nearly five years on, if anything, the opposite has occurred. In many countries in the region, limited reforms have been rolled back, while in places such as Egypt, sexual harassment has become epidemic. Recently, I spoke to Mona el a prominent Egyptian-American writer, about her latest book entitled Headscarves and Hymens, Why the Middle East Needs a Sexual Revolution. I began by asking her if the region, given its very conservative attitudes towards women, was indeed capable of undergoing such a revolution. Well, the point that I make over and over again in my book is that without a social and a sexual revolution, our political revolutions will fail. And by that, I mean when the Tunisians first rose up against Ben Ali in 2010 and inspired so many of us to rise up against our own dictators, it was men and women recognizing the state oppresses everyone. But when we went home, as women who marched in those revolutions, we recognized, or we must recognize, that it's a trifecta of misogyny, the state, the street, and the home, that together oppress women. So the point that I make in my book is that unless we have that social sexual revolution, that political one will fail, and you see us stumbling and stuck 
and stagnant because it's just political in Egypt, in Tunisia, etc. So, so what is driving this misogyny? It's a toxic mix of religion and culture. It's, and by religion, I don't just mean Islam, I mean Christianity as well. So you see it again and again where the state or legislation or cultural practices, all of them are built on a foundation um, of religious practices from Muslim and Christian communities that benefit men, are for men, and of course women don't benefit at all from any of these practices. Now, um, who is your book actually targeting? My book actually targets everybody because I believe as an Egyptian, as a Muslim, as a feminist, I have the right to write about my culture and my religion and my part of the world in a way that I wouldn't like someone from outside that region to write because it's my story. So, you know, we have to tell our own stories, but we also have to name and shame. And so I want, I want, I want my book to be my flag on the global feminist spectrum. It's, it, women in the Middle East and North Africa have a fight against misogyny and patriarchy. Women here in France have a fight. Women in China have a fight. But we just have different degrees of fights. So I want everyone around the world to read my book. I want them to be angry, and I want them to ask what in my own community does, can feminism achieve, because clearly it's not finished. But the reality is there's a lot of people in the Middle East who don't like what you say. Absolutely, and, and I, I understand, because when I talk about dismantling that, misog that triangle of misogyny, I'm talking about the men, uh, whether they're politicians or ordinary men, fathers, brothers, all of this, husbands, who benefit from this triangle that oppresses women. But men all also have to understand that when feminism talks about deconstructing social notions of femininity. We're also talking about deconstructing these rigid roles for men, hyper-masculinity, um, toxic notions of masculinity. So my, my, my point in the book too is feminism is good for everybody, not just for women. So what needs to be done? If you were there and you're addressing these young women and men in countries across the Middle East and North Africa, what strategy would you outline? Right, well, I, when I am there, and that's why I moved back to Cairo, what we need is we need to work on a legal level. So we need to change the laws. We need to have laws that protect girls against female genital mutilation, for example, protect women against domestic and sexual violence. We need social change. We need boys and young men on the street to recognize that public space is not theirs, is mine too. In the home, because this is where the fiercest revolution will take place, because that's where Mubarak in the presidential palace and Mubarak on the street, he goes home. So that's where the real revolution must begin. And I, in Cairo, one of the things I did was I set up a support group for women. And I would ask the women in my group, what has the revolution changed for you? And they'd say, it's taught me to go home and say no I demand this this word I demand and I know at least 10 women who've removed their headscarf since the revolution and they've directly connected it to ideas of personal liberty and they've said I can't liberate my country until I liberate myself so on all those levels political legal social sexual and home but most importantly in the mind there's so much to do it's a very long struggle but I'm a tenacious optimist I, I can see that and it really as you say it's about changing mindsets and that's not going to happen overnight is no it? definitely when I when I say we began something irreversible, I say in a recognition it will take 10, 20 years, but that's okay. The, whatever feminist achievements you have here in France, and you still have a long way to go, there's still no pay equality, political equality, domestic and sexual violence are still here. But that feminist fight has been happening for a while. We, we begin something now, I might not see it in my lifetime, but future gen generations of women and men will recognise their freedom and equality is because of what we're doing now. Mona al we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Now, as we mentioned earlier, sexual harassment has become a major problem in Egypt. With government policy doing little to affect it, Egyptian women are coming up with ideas of their own. Bell Upton and Chris Moore report on a new company that sprung up in Cairo, a taxi service run by women for women. There's a new colour in Cairo's traffic and you'll see it splashed across a fleet of cars. These are pink taxis, a service by women for women, created to guarantee female passenger safety in a country where sexual harassment is rife. Drivers must have a college degree and speak fluent English before they're allowed obligatory training. We give them first aid training so that if something happens to a passenger, they can assist her. We also give them self-defense training and we teach them the principles of safety and security and about safe driving. We need a safe transport service for Egyptian women. In fact, not just Egyptian women, but also foreigners and Arab women, women in general. Female sexual harassment, or taharosh, is endemic in Egypt. A 2013 UN study found that over 99% of Egyptian women have been sexually harassed, either verbally or physically, by men. 
In this footage from Tahrir Square, a group of men surrounds a woman and carries her off, tearing off her trousers in the crowd before sexually assaulting her. Pink Taxi may be an example of grassroots action, but Egyptian society remains extremely conservative. Victims of rape are discouraged from filing a complaint not only by the police and magistrates, but also by their families, who fear social shame. It's a new idea that I like very much. I feel like girls are saying, we're here, we can do something. Of course, Egyptian society will always reject new ideas and won't understand why such an initiative was created in the first place. But society will get used to it, and I'm sure Pink Taxi will succeed. The rise of violence towards women since the Arab Spring has made Egypt the worst country in the Arab world to be a woman. Egyptian authorities have only recently woken up to the problem. Last year, they passed new laws punishing sexual harassment with at least six months in prison or a 3,000 Egyptian pounds fine. And that's it for now. And if you'd like to comment on what you've just seen, you can head to our Facebook page. That's France 24, full stop, 51%. Or do send us a tweet at underscore 51%. Thanks for your feedback so far. And please do keep those comments coming in. In the meantime, we're going to leave you with images of the Eiffel Tower here in Paris being illuminated as part of Pink October. The campaign is a worldwide one-month operation to raise awareness of breast cancer. So until our next program, bye for now.